Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome to this episode from Lessons from the Playroom. I am excited today as we're going to talk about games in play therapy. So how many of you have games like Uno and Shoots and Ladders and Life, maybe Jenga, just different kinds of games in your playroom. And maybe you're wondering, how do I really make these therapeutic? You know, what do I do when the child cheats? Um, How do I really look at the best way of using these games in the play therapy process? So we're going to talk a little bit about that in this particular podcast. So here we go. There are some theories out there that say don't have games in the playroom. Um, I'm a huge fan of games in the playroom. I think that they're familiar with kiddos and kids gravitate towards them pretty easily. I think the, the, the part that we have to really understand is what to do when they go to the game and how to make it really therapeutic. So the first thing that let's take a look at are just the typical games that are in a playroom. So like I said, there's shoots and ladders, typically Candyland, memory. Um, there's also card games, Uno's um, uh, one that shows up quite a bit. Checkers, chess. There's also structured therapeutic games like the talking, feeling, doing game. There's all kinds of really cool games on, you know, loss and divorce and that are they're really topic specific. But then there are other things like ball play and peekaboo, which are also games that naturally arise in play therapy. And then obstacle courses. I don't know about you, but sometimes my kiddos create all kinds of really cool obstacle courses um, in my playroom. So those are some typical games that we typically see in a playroom or in the play therapy process. And what I want us to just first tune into is um, really the look at the difference between games as assessment and games as intervention. Some of the games are very assessment oriented in and of itself. So you can look at, for example, um, how the child is playing the game, or how are they approaching the game. Um, if you have a more structured game that is actually designed to help understand like their um, their cognitive level, their social skills, ability, their um, emotional levels. You know, you can actually use games as assessment. And then there's games as intervention. So again, some of the structured therapeutic games are, are very directive in nature and very much an intervention. Um, but if even if a child just gravitates towards UNO or gravitates towards Candyland, those can also be used as, um, as intervention. Um, it just has to do with the way that you use the game. So really how I want to talk about that is moving the game into more of the therapeutic process itself. So I'm going to invite us to look at children approaching games as a reflection of their inner world. And so it's really interesting to look at the metaphor of the game itself. So I'll give you an example. Candyland and Shoots and Ladders. Um, I don't know when the last time you played Candyland or Shoots and Ladders are, but wow, is it a game of hypervigilance and unpredictability. You have no idea what's going to happen next. You don't know what card you're going to draw. You don't know if you're going to be at the end of the game and then all of a sudden get sent all the way back to the beginning. Very, very much a game that um, really looks at 
how do we handle the unpredictable nature of things? It can be a fantastic game, for example, for kids that are struggling with anxiety or struggling with how to approach or handle the unknown. Um, another one, so ball play. So again, if you look at the metaphor of ball play, so ball play, depending on how the ball is thrown or tossed back and forth, can very much be a metaphor of relationship. You know, does the child just take the ball and just throw it at you without you being prepared? Well, is that a metaphor for how they communicate or do relationship um, outside the playroom? Does the child not pass the ball at all? You know, is that also a metaphor? Um, is there a, a fluid back and forth? So what I invite you to do is to take the games that you have in your room and to spend some time really thinking about what are the various metaphors that can be used in the games, in the play, and what types of feelings and what types of experiences might a child have and why might that gravitate towards those particular games. It's a super fun, super fun process. But it's a really important one so that we get beyond the idea that the child's just playing Uno or they're just playing Jenga. Um, remember that the games themselves are a reflection of their inner world. And more specifically, they are going to, as the child plays with them, the way in which they play with them is actually going to bring to life the actual feelings that the child is trying to explore in the room. Okay. The next piece that we want to look at when we're talking about games is determining the emotional age. Now, we can do this by looking at the actual game they're choosing. So if you have a 10-year-old client, as an example, and they're wanting to play peekaboo, that's a pretty big indicator that there's a lower emotional age. Um, or you have an 8-year-old that wants to play Candyland. Candyland is not typically played by eight years old, right? It's played by children much younger. So really look at the age of the game that it was designed for and look at the chronological age of the kiddo that you're working with. And again, just assess those clues. That's another way of really beginning to understand um, what's the emotional age of the child while we're doing the therapeutic play in this particular session, it'll give you insight into when in the child's perception the struggle that they're working on began or when it was occurring because children regress to the age at where the problem is that they're trying to work on in the playroom and we need to be aware of some of the little clues to help us understand the emotional age that, that corresponds with this. You know, another game is pickup sticks. So again, you know, it's like looking at how is the child playing with the pickup sticks? Are they just sorting them by color and they're not actually playing the game, which again is an indicator of a lower emotional age? Are they inviting you into play or are you left out and you just have to watch? Are they setting you up to fail in some way um, as you're invited to play with them? You know, what's the metaphor of that relationally? Um, what's their frustration tolerance? So again, if you're going to look at games as more of an assessment, you could use that as a, an assessment because there is a frustration piece that can happen. Um, how do they handle frustration? How do they handle anxiety? Because those are feelings that often get elicited in pickup sticks. So again, I'm just trying to give you some different ideas about how to think about games. Um, this is a just a, a much more, um, there's a lot more to be said about this as a topic in play therapy, but I want to just give you a couple little tidbits to consider as you are strengthening your understanding of how to use these. The next piece that I want you to begin to get curious about is let's call it nervous system regulation in games. So I said this earlier that as children play the game, the way in which they interact with the game, how they set you up in the game is all giving rise to the felt sense of what's happening for the child. 
And this is going to be an indicator of what's happening as far as their nervous system state of regulation or dysregulation. So if you have a lot of anxiety, overwhelm, aggression that's happening, chances are the child's um, system is in a sympathetic uh, fight-flight response. If the child is beginning to collapse and shut down while they are playing the game or relating to the game or they're really shutting you out, chances are the child's nervous system is more in a state of a parasympathetic dorsal response where they're starting to move into the collapse state. Um, they're possibly more like in their head trying to analyze and figure it out rather than feeling their way through the game. And this is all really important information for you as the clinician because it helps you, again, it's not just about sitting there and playing a game with a child. There's so much more that is unraveling right there in the playroom between the child and the game, between you and the child and the game, and even with you and the game. So I'm going to pause here and invite us all to take a deep breath as we're talking about nervous system regulation. Okay, so the last piece that I'm going to talk about um, on this podcast are our roles during the game play. And, and there's a couple of things for us to consider here. So the first is we really need to look at um, our own need to win and our own feelings of competitiveness. And I've, I've seen this a lot where therapists just have this need to win. And um, I'm not saying don't win in a game. I'm just saying to look at the need to win. You know, chances are the child won't let you win or they won't want you to win. And we do need to be aware of that because we're not typically in the playroom being set up to feel empowered or to feel like we have the power. Um, and we're set up to experience what it feels like to be the child. So chances are we're going to lose and chances are we're going to have an experience of feeling either not good enough or like we can't quite get it right. Those are pretty common feelings that we um, have to encounter during during games. But for the child, you know, as the child's trying to help us get it, we do need to look at our own experience of this. Because if we are really uncomfortable with not winning and we're really competitive, we may actually try to take control when the child begins to play games. And we may really begin to step in and start to guide and drive the therapy instead of continuing to let the child lead their process. And that is even if you are engaging in a directive experience. You know, even if you choose the game, there's still a really important piece in there where we have to let the child lead their own experience within the directive process itself so that they can begin to work through what they're working through without us guiding every single step of the way. That's just my opinion, but I think that's, that is something to, uh, to consider. So as, the, as we're looking at our, our role, you know, I really view our role in games as helping facilitate a process and helping um, facilitate the child's relationship with the game itself and the child's relationship with me and the game. Um, you can think through that for yourself and really try to get curious about what role do you feel like you play when the child brings out the games. And then within that, there are some common play patterns. You know, children will want to control our moves, right? They move for us. They tell us what to do. Sometimes they cheat. Um, sometimes they make us win all the time. Sometimes they speed the game up at the end and you don't get to win when you were just about to win. Sometimes you're playing and then all of a sudden they change the rules. Sometimes um, they'll teach you a game that you don't understand. And, and all of this is insight again into the child's emotional world. You know, from a synergetic play therapy perspective, the child is setting us up to feel what it feels like to be them. So I encourage you, next time you're in that room playing a game, um, yes, there's a part of observing how the child is interacting with the game and to look at the assessment part of it, but there's also a piece to just sit back 
and feel what it feels like to play the game with the child and to feel the setup, right? To feel what the child is trying to elicit in you when they cheat, when the rules keep changing, when you're about to win and all of a sudden you can't win because that is huge insight into what's actually happening for the child. And it's through that process, deepening that process, beginning to name part of that experience that really helps make games highly therapeutic in the playroom. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.